you. I took me the freedom to uh, to bring some speaking notes since I'm not speaking English every day. Um, I'm quite convinced that the image will differ uh, based on uh, on uh, uh, who you ask, what kind of image they have of the sport, and uh, that could be uh, any stakeholder, any regular race cover, or people that are not into the sport uh, at all. And we saw from the video that uh, people that are not into the sport, they uh, uh, many of them mean that we should ban horse racing completely. And that's because they probably have an image like this of the sport. We know about their arguments. We heard uh, in the video previously. We use the horses only for uh, people's entertainment and entertainment in a sinful gambling industry. The horses are being used and discarded by people with no thoughts for the animal. There's a lot of fatalities and major injuries of horses in racing. The jockeys treat the horses brutally by painful whipping and urging. There's a lot of result manipulation through medication and doping. And the race horses have a short and unworthy life. And ladies and gentlemen, they are not many, but they speak loudly. And if you do not take this seriously, and their arguments seriously, our industry will die. I'm quite convinced about that. This means we must uh, think thoroughly about our values, build them with thoughts of the horses in our forehead, and communicate them not only by words, but most important, by action. So, how do we build our values then? Well, <laughs> I'm not God, so I, I will not teach you about that, but I can uh, tell you about uh, our approach uh, in Norway to the task and our philosophy about this. And uh, this is, in fact, from the Norwegian Animal Welfare Law, which uh, comes from the parliament. Animal have an intrinsic value which is irrespective of the usable value they have for man. Animals shall be treated well and be protected from danger of unnecessary stress and strains. And the law is built on the five freedoms for animal in human care. The five freedoms, that is freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain, injury or disease, freedom to express normal behavior, and freedom from fear and distress. And that means this is what we must build our values on. Therefore, the, the knowledge of the horse's natural instincts, needs and skills must be the ground pillar for our work and our regulations. A little bit about uh, their nature. You probably know the, the most of you, but uh, by nature the horse is a prey. This means that being fast and enduring was a prerequisite uh, <coughs> for survival. Our domesticated horses no longer live under the same challenging uh, conditions, but they have kept the same instinct and physical characteristics. And like other species, the horse develops its skills at young age by running together, measuring strength with each other, or through play and free expressions. Well, these skills are developed through long-term targeted breeding and training at the horse's own terms. And that means that our race horses are born to race, and they love it if we train and race them on their own premises. These bubbles, bubbles uh, represent um, important factors that uh, has influence on our horse welfare policy. And it all starts with fair treatment of the horses by every individual human. But in addition to that, we as the governing body of the racing must keep the horses welfare in front in any action we take. And that goes from race propositions, the racing regulations, the surface of the racetracks, the anti-doping and medication rules to the control regime, and it even st uh, don't stop there, and I will get back to that. 
But let me get into some of the bubbles that uh, perhaps is special for, for Norway and also some that is special for the Nordic countries. In Norway, we do not raise two-year-old standard bred horses in, in, uh, in our country. But the owners get a training bonus if they present them in a certain qualifying race, which only the time counts. They qualify for the bonus if they are within a specific time slot. If they trot faster or slower, the result is not valid and they will not get the bonus. And we also try to build our race propositions in a way so that the horses can last for several years. Coldwood horses, they race between the age of three and 15, and we try to use them the whole time. Warm blood horses between three and 14. But then you can't have races to, that you take out everything as a two, three or four year old. And if you're going further on to the racing regulations, so uh, we are the only country in the world with completely whip-free races, and it has been like that in 44 years. Despite this fact, we have tremendous trotters with astonishing, <coughs> astonishing performances, which, for instance, breaks world records from time to time. So it is possible to have good horses that performs very well without using a whip. Going further on to the anti-doping and medication, the artificial increase of the physical capability of horses using drugs is well known in horse racing. And there are three main reasons that demand the prohibition of drugs. To ensure the welfare of the horse, to ensure the punters that races are won fairly by horses' merits as athletes, and to protect the integrity of the breeding industry. In absence of a single organization regulating the anti-doping framework, like for instance WADA for the human being, the Nordic countries work closely together and our rules are almost the same. We are probably the most strictest rules for medication of racehorses in the world, with absolutely zero tolerance for any active substance of any kind in the races. No Lasix, no antimicrobial drugs, but or anti-ulcer medication. We also operate with standard periods for all kinds of legal medicines, treatments and other substances. And this period represents an absolute minimum rest period after treatment before they are allowed to race. The period is based on the welfare of the horse. And in most occasions, this time is much longer than the detection time or the withdrawal time of the drug. If a horse needs painkilling medication like butte joint injection or antimicrobial <coughs> drugs, the reason would be that the horse is injured, overloaded or in pain and therefore deserve a certain time to recover. Standard periods can be from 8 to 60 days depending on the substance of the treatment. So the control regime. These rules that I've just gone through, of course, demand an effective control regime. All kinds of treatment, not only medication, must be recorded in the horse's medical journal, which always follows the horse when traveling. And the journal is regularly controlled by vets and stewards. Incompletely or improperly, listings of treatment in the journal constitutes a breach of the doping regulations. And they also control that the trainers respect our rules by unannounced auto competition controls. In those camp controls, we also look at the general welfare, indoor and outdoor facilities, training program, feeding, physical and mental health of the horse, hoof care, if medicines are kept according to our regulations, etc. And that is necessary if you should have that kind of, of rule because you have to have the possibility to detect any breach of the rule. We believe that an active policy on equine welfare are better than treatment or medication. It is possible to make top resources through focus on natural, physical and mental health. The horses are top athletes 
and should be treated accordingly with all respect. And a happy horse has an advantage. Another thing that might be a bit different in the Nordic countries is the focus on having the horses outside in their natural habitat. And if you are on a summer vacation in Norway, hiking in the mountains, you might meet a crowd like this. These are yearlings having their summer holiday without any fences that keeps them locked in before they start the training at the autumn, going out for about two months time. To get, to get acceptance in your work with equine welfare, your system has to have integrity and credibility from A to Z. You have to put the horse first and think about the need of the horse. You have to work with the attitude of the horse keepers from a young age. Today, our uh, chief veterinary, the, the head of our animal welfare department in Norwegian Trotting Association, are on a camp for youngsters uh, from the equestrian society, from the trotting and from the th uh, thoroughbred society, and the first lecture is about horse welfare. We have to build the rules to protect the horses and punters. We have to have an e effective control regime, and we have to have a good judging system, which give proper reactions to rule breakers. But the work doesn't stop there. Because if you're not able to punish the right ones for breaking our rules, we will lose credibility. In Norway, we had a trainer who had his license suspended for two years that continued his business through another person as nothing had happened. And that happens in many other countries I, I, uh, I recognize. But because of the rule I will read for you, we blew up the whole setup by a planned operation to take them with a pants down. And this is quite controversial, but, uh, but this is in our regulation, in our racing code. A person licensed by DNT shall not employ or in any other way collaborate with a person serving a period of ineligibility for violation of DNT's anti-doping rules or the anti-doping rules for any other country or horse racing authority. It seems quite similar to, to uh, the WADA code, in fact. But further, Correspondingly, no person serving a period of ineligibility for breach of DNT's anti-doping rules or breach of the anti-doping rules of any other country or horse racing authority may not take employment with or, with or enter into an agreement for collaboration, <coughs> collaboration with a person licensed by DNT. And furthermore, with collaboration means work, services, giving advice, related to a license holder's activity under the jurisdiction of DNT, including but not limited to training, feeding, treatment, or shoeing of horses. And collaboration is prohibited regardless of whether it includes any type of compensation. This is made to be sure that if you have punished a guy, this punishment shall work. So, how do we get acceptance then? Well, we didn't get acceptance from the stakeholders in 1976 by banning the VIP. We were, we were forced by the parliament to change over rules by the new animal welfare law that uh, forbid to use the VIP for, <coughs> for pushing the horses, for urging them. And uh, the board of the Norwegian Trotting Association said that if the horses will be disqualified by that, this would be too difficult for the panel of judges to, to, uh, to sort out, and it would be too difficult for our audience to uh, see the difference. So they banned the VIP completely from 1976. And the horsemen made a lot of noise uh, for the first years, uh, for the first 10 years, I believe. Uh, but after, after that, we, we don't hear any more about that. And uh, the breeding has, uh, 
as being so good, so the horses run anyway. The other rule changes are proposed by ourselves, and that's a little bit easier. And when we propose changes in our rules, they are always built on facts. We inform about the changes at an early stage, and we explain the purpose of the changes to both the public, the stakeholders, and the government. And <coughs> in, addition, if you, uh, in addition to that, if you have a system with credibility that people believe in, it is always easier. And I have to say that when we blew the setup business to the Punish trainer I, I mentioned, the public opinion to our equine welfare work changed dramatically in a positive way because they saw that thing worked. They got evidence that the system worked. So with integrity in all aspects of uh, your equine welfare and a proactive communication, you have done a lot. That's what I had to say to you today. Thank you very much. I'm quite amazed, actually. This is uh, quite unique from what I understand. So, uh, great, uh, great job. Any questions that we have from the floor? Yes, we do have one question from Harold. Microphone. I, I will get the microphone for you. I'll hand it to you back here. Uh, Sven Morten, in most other sports, uh, they have common rules and regulations, uh, and even for medication and that kind of stuff. Um, you are also a board member of UAT. Yep. Uh, when can we expect that there will be common rules in uh, horse racing as well, just as there is in human sports, uh, for whip use and uh, medication? I shall not predict that, but uh, in fact, we work quite closely with each other, and there are uh, progress in the harmonization uh, of the rules all over Europe uh, in the UET, in the, in the trotting business. Uh, in the Nordic countries, the rules are almost the same, uh, and, and the regulation for, for the drugs are, are the same. And uh, it has been harmonized step by step in the UET as well. But, um, Unfortunately, I, I can't give you a date on that. A any other questions? Yes, there is, actually. It's a raising question, uh, Sven. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll give it time. Yeah, it's better. It's better. Thank you. Hello, Hi. I'm Marina. I'm working for German Racing Communications Department. First of all, it's very interesting to uh, listen to what you are saying. When it comes to proactive communication, um, also Jason and um, you were talking about PETA. Um, do you think that, uh, how big is PETA in Norway? How are you communicating with them if you are or if they are willingly to listen? And do you think you are in a better position due to the fact that you are not using the whip? Uh, I believe that we are in a better, better position, yes. Uh, and at the moment, uh, regarding the, the horse racing, they uh, have not their focus on that at the moment. Uh, PETA is active in Nor Norway uh, with a lot of other animal welfare activists uh, as well. Uh, they are looking into the, uh, to the farmers industry more than the horse racing industry at the moment. But um, at the time, uh, I'm quite sure that they will look into our business as well. And at that time, they are welcome. Uh, and we should have a system that, that is so transparent that you, that you can show it to, to, to everyone and be proud of it. Uh, and you have to strive to, to, to have a system like that, in fact. Yeah, I think so too. Thank you. Mm. If I could just come very quickly back into on, on that question, because um, it is a very vitally important one. Um, I'm chief executive in my day job uh, for British Dressage, and with our rules and regulations, we worked in close partnership with World Horse Welfare. And I think the issue here is, rather than engage with some of the more extreme animal rights groups, the opportunity here is to engage with welfare groups that are interested in working with us as equine horse sport 
to actually uh, develop ethical standards that we can apply right the way across the industry. And they did want to be here uh, today to talk to you all, um, but if you are at the IFHA conference on Monday, um, they will be present there and we'll look forward to uh, taking your questions then. Well, thank you very much, Sven. Thank you. Great applause to you, yes. That deserves actually a great applause.